You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBGive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. This is the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving, and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor. You know, you think about advocacy work and the impact it can have and how difficult it is to really achieve impact through advocacy. Um, But there are some examples of organizations that have made huge change in the way we live, work, and play. You can think about, for instance, smoking cessation. There was a time in my life when it looked like everybody smoked. And now that's not the case. Although I know that people who are working on this issue have to remain diligent to make sure that we don't fall backwards in certain areas. But one of the areas that has impressed me the most in their advocacy efforts to create change has been an organization that we know as Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Now, this is an organization that started in the 80s and made significant inroads in how we look at and think about getting behind the wheel while we're, while we're impaired or while we've had something to drink, alcoholic or other substances. And you want to know, well, how were we able to make that change? How were they able to do it? And yet we also know that while they were able to make change, it's not something that is static. As new generations come on, they have to be educated and taught to deal with problems in a way that is productive. And we have to make sure that they're getting that education and that information. It's not a static result that we get through our advocacy efforts. But today with me is the head of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and that's Stacy Stewart. And Stacy has had a remarkable career in social service. She was once the head of the Fannie Mae Foundation. She also was the USA president of the United Way. And she also was the CEO of March of Dimes. So you can see that she's had an amazing career in leadership levels of some pretty legacy organizations. So I want to welcome Stacy to the Heart of Giving podcast. And my first question, Stacy, is to you about how do you sew together this remarkable career you've had leading these amazing organizations? Well, thank you, Art. And it's great to be here with you. Um, uh, so how do I sew it together? Well, you know, um, and when you were just talking, I could probably imagine people thinking, I don't know how those, how all those things connect. but. But here's how they connect for me. Um, so I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up uh, in a family that was very much, uh, a, you know, two professionals, uh, a mom and a dad. Uh, a father who was a physician and a mother who was trained as a pharmacist and then later on became an elected official. Um, but they really taught me and my sister um, that it was really important to always give back. So even in your professional career, always giving back. And so even though when I went to school, I went to Georgetown for economics and uh, went to Michigan for business school and concentrated in finance, and I actually went on to uh, pursue a career in finance and banking, I really thought that was kind of where I would sort of land in terms of my career long term. Uh, but I found something at Michigan at business school, an opportunity to work on Wall Street that was a little different than the path that I thought I was going to be on. Still, still involved in finance and in banking, but in a slightly different way. And it was to work in an area in investment banking called public finance. So this was kind of raising money the way 
uh, people do on Wall Street to raise money for companies to uh, do mergers and acquisitions or, acqui you know, other kinds of um, elements around corporate finance. This was really an effort to work with state and local governments to raise money for really important public projects. So raising money for roads and bridges and schools and hospitals. And um, it really it really uh, spoke to me that I could use my education in finance and economics to actually do good so that I didn't have to pursue a professional career and then do good for others in my part time. I could actually do them together. Right. So I went to uh, start my career on Wall Street. Uh, I worked in an area called public finance for about five years. A headhunter called about coming to Fannie Mae, which was a large financial institution that also did good. Uh, so working on Wall Street to uh, raise money for uh, all kinds of public projects. And um, I a headhunter called about going to Fannie Mae, which is, again, another large financial institution that uh, raises capital for housing needs of low and moderate income families. So again, the combination of finance and doing good. Uh, I stayed at Fannie Mae for a total of 17 years. Half of the time was in the company, half of it. Uh, I was uh, leading all the philanthropic efforts and was the president and CEO of the Fannie Mae Foundation, which was a separate entity from the company at the time, but still related. And, um, and then after my time at Fannie Mae and the Fannie Mae Foundation, I went to, as you mentioned, uh, go to United Way Worldwide. And eventually I became the head of the, uh, the U.S. president for United Way Worldwide. And again, the largest uh, charitable uh, organization in the world and leading the, the national, U.S. national part of United Way Worldwide, which at the time was the largest part of United Way and so again, a big institution with lots of financial resources, but doing good. Um, all of these changes were prompted by headhunters calling and saying, hey, I, you, I love what you're doing. Would you be interested in, a, in another opportunity? And that led to the March of Dimes. Um, again, an, a, a historic organization that has done good for maternal and infant health, help in the polio crisis epidemic in this country, and really, um, uh, uh, to around the world, not quite, uh, we haven't quite gotten to an end around the world, but it has prompted that to be hope, hopefully an, an inevitability that polio would come to an end at some point. Certainly ending it here in the U.S. was a historic achievement. And then a headhunter called about coming to Matt. And so I, um, again, another historic organization, the leader in addressing the issues of impaired driving. So all of my career, I think, has been art, uh, marked by this idea that I could use business skills and finance skills to do good. Um, and my idea of doing good hasn't been limited to just one thing. The, the world needs a lot of good. <laughs> and so I've, been, I've enjoyed the idea of being able to do good in lots of different ways, whether it's around public education, housing and ending homelessness, whether it's around uh, maternal and infant health, or whether it's around ending the crisis of impaired driving on our roads. Um, all of those things have spoke to me in terms of what's important to me, um, the issues and the causes that I've gotten involved with and trying to work in organizations that need help to be retooled and revitalized to continue to make impact um, because the job is not done as we all know in all these areas. So just trying to make progress in all these areas has really been an important part of what I think of as hopefully my legacy and where I've been able to, you know, use my skills uh, to, to, to contribute to improving the lives of many people in, in many different ways. You know, I wanted to ask about your business and finance background, which, you know, are pretty, most people look at business leaders and they say they're going to be focused on the metrics. They're going to be getting things done. They're not really, they don't have time to really be soft and all that. How do you use your business and finance skills? in a nonprofit setting, which some people might say is not necessarily the best use of a business skill. How do you make it work in a nonprofit setting, your background? Yeah, I find that to be really interesting. Um, you know, I went to Michigan and I talk a lot to, um, you know, alum of the Ross School of Business around that business skills are needed as much in the for-profit sector as in the um, as in the nonprofit sector and the governmental sector for that matter. Um, I think one of the things that people have criticized nonprofits about historically is not being focused enough 
on metrics, on outcomes and impact. Uh, I think it's wrong to hold the nonprofit sector accountable for those things. I think we should be held accountable for uh, achieving measurable outcomes that we can uh, weave together in a story that really talks about the meaningful change that we're making in the world. I think donors deserve that. I think investors who are investing in our social impact want to know whether or not their, their dollars are being invested into worthy causes led by people who are doing remarkable things. And I think that's a story that we all have to tell. So I, you know, I tend to think that my business skills are, uh, are of critical importance to the work that we're doing. Um, when we're talking about saving lives, as we're doing at Mothers Against Drunk Driving, it's really important to be able to measure our, our work and to be able to talk about the number of lives saved, the number of people we've touched and we, we've reached, the number, the degree to which we've made roads safer and the degree to which we've tried to make sure that young people are made aware of the dangers of impaired driving. We've got to be able to measure those outcomes. We've got to be able to know whether or not our work is making a difference. And we've got to be able to use those metrics in ways that allow us to shift and adjust as necessary, just like you'd find in a company. If a company is uh, producing products or involved in any kind of uh, business or consulting efforts or whatever it is, they have to know whether or not their customers are happy. They have to know whether or not they're making uh, a bottom line impact. All those things are the same. I think it's very important to understand that the, the only real difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit organization or entity is really a tax status. Um, many of the things that we focus on in the nonprofit sector are the same things we have to focus on. Are we profitable uh, in, a, in a sense that you know, if we're operating a deficit, that's not a sustainable thing, right? So or whether you're a nonprofit or for profit, it doesn't matter. Uh, do you have su sufficient cash flow to sustain your operations? You know, are you competitive in the marketplace? Um, you know, are you able to attract the best talent, right? These are all things that I have to focus on as a CEO. And these are the same conversations that I'm talking to a corporate CEO, the same kinds of things that they're focusing on, on as well. And so, um, you know, I think we've, kind of lost ourselves in this idea that nonprofit leaders have to be soft and, you know, and not be so concerned about these kinds of outcomes. I just think that's simply wrong. Um, I think nonprofit leaders have a different mission sometimes. I mean, our mission is around things that are changing society and community, um, and that may be different from products produced. But at the end of the day, the metrics are often the same and the outcomes are often the same. And uh, in terms of things that we measure in terms of organizational success. So I think I think they are completely transferable. What I learned at business school is completely transferable to the work I do every single day, whether it's at MAD or at any of the other positions I've held. Yeah, well, you sing into my ears because <laughs> it's a little known fact that I started my career as a CPA. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, yes. you're definitely, you know, singing my song and... Yeah. Uh, and so I try to keep it secret so people don't think that I'm <laughs> <laughs> just focused on the numbers. But yeah. you have to be. You have and, to. you know, it's not true that our missions are easy to achieve. I mean, right. look at what you're doing. It's not easy to get people to do what's sensible, right, sometimes. Mm -hmm. But we have to keep pressing forward. But you also want to measure the, the progress that you are making. You want to know where you're not performing. And you have to keep tabs on those things so that you know That's what right. you're doing. Hope, hope matters, right? Hope is all about let's try it, even though we don't know for sure if it'll work or not. We need okay. that too. But once we start moving, we have to make sure that we're building institutions that are sustainable and can, can follow up on that hope that we have. So great to hear that. And I'm glad that you have succeeded in so many organizations with your business and finance orientation. That, that's some progress, I think, that we're making. Yes. Let me ask you, though, more about MAD. Yeah. Um, and how are we doing? Um, as I said in the intro, I thought we were, I, I know we've made progress because I can just think back to the days in the 1980s when no one even talked about this. No one talked about it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly MAD came on the scene in a very bold and assertive way 
and said to us, we need to look at this. We need to do this differently. We need to think about what happens when you get behind the wheel impaired and the effects that it can have on you and other people who are innocent because of your behavior. And things slowly began to change and we saw some progress. So what progress have we seen, Stacy? And what challenges still lie ahead for us? Yeah, it's a really good question. So there's no question we've made a lot of progress since the early 80s when MAD was uh, founded. Uh, we'll be 45 years old next year, and there has been a significant amount of progress over that 45-year history uh, in reducing the number of fatalities and injuries on our roads as a result of impaired driving. Um, MAD was started as an organization uh, by a, a woman who had lost her daughter uh, in a drunk driving crash. And it was out of her passion and turning that passion into pain that MAD started and really exploded in terms of a grassroots movement throughout the country. And so now we are active in just about every state around the country. We are involved in advocacy and serving victims and survivors and really trying, trying to change the outcomes so that we keep our roads safer. That is a good thing. We've seen a 50% decline in the number of impaired driving fatalities since MAD started in the, in the early 80s. Um, if you ask people of a certain age who MAD is, people will remember a lot of things about MAD, about how we were in their schools talking about um, not getting behind the wheel if you've been drinking, how, uh, and certainly if you're underage, not drinking at all, and making sure that people are aware of the dangers of underage drinking, the, the dangers of, of getting behind the wheel if you've been especially using alcohol. Um, what's really important though, and a lot of people don't even know this about MAD, that a lot of things that we kind of take for granted are really because of MAD and our leadership. So the fact that we have 0.08 as a federal law um, uh, for a blood alcohol concentration level to determine the level of impairment, that is because of MAD and uh, MAD's leadership around the country. The fact that we have stronger seatbelt laws, right? A lot of that's because of MAD and other organizations fighting hard for that. Or the fact that we have a minimum age of 21 um, as a legal limit uh, for, for drinking. These are things that MAD has specifically contributed to that have made meaningful progress. But I think what has happened, especially over more recent years, is a couple of things. One is that I think in MAD, we took our foot off of the gas a little bit in terms of continuing to really, really pound the public with these messages around um, drunk driving and impaired driving is a crime, it's 100% preventable, and that people have to uh, make decisions that keep people safe. So if you've been drinking uh, or using other substances, you should not be behind the wheel. I think we took our, our eye off the ball a little bit in terms of continuing to pound those messages publicly in schools, especially with young people. So a lot of young people, while you know I'm of a certain age where uh, I know of MAD, uh, there are a lot of young people when I ask them and tell them, hey, I'm the CEO of MAD, they're like, what is that? <laughs> what is that organization? I've never heard of that before. So that's one thing. The second thing is that um, even, so, even though we saw that 50% decline since MAD started, in recent years, especially during the years of COVID between 2019 and 2022, we saw a significant increase in impaired driving fatalities uh, on our roads, even when driving was, there was less driving going on. So we were all in lockdown. Um, we uh, were not on the roads as much, but we saw a 33% increase in fatalities and a significant increase in injuries. So what we have to acknowledge uh, is going on is the fact that we lost a generation or two of people who didn't get that message around the dangers of drunk driving and we were facing uh, an unprecedented crisis of, of, um, of mental health challenges, um, anxiety, depression, a lot of mental health issues, a lot of alcohol and other substances being used, people then getting on the roads and driving after they had been either drinking or using other substances and making our roads safer uh, and unsafe, uh, less safe, I should say. And that has been a big challenge that we're now trying to bend the curve back down of making sure that people are aware that this is still a crisis on our roads, that we haven't completely done away with this. A lot of people think, oh, well, we have ride share. Didn't people get these messages from years ago? Well, no, we have not uh, been getting through to as many people as we need to around the dangers of underage drinking and the dangers of getting behind the wheel 
uh, and drinking and using substances. The last thing I'll just say about this is that um, there's a lot more we're seeing in the data around who are the people that are impaired today, right? When we look at uh, a lot of the drivers who are contributing to the fatalities, two thirds of them are driving at the level of 0.15 or greater in terms of their blood alcohol concentration level. Remember, the legal limit is 0.08. People, two thirds of the drivers that are leading to the fatalities are at 0.15 or above. That's almost twice the legal limit. And just to put that in perspective, Art, someone at 0.15 or above is uh, on average, and everyone's different, but just say on average, it's it's comparable to a, a man, a 160 pound, 60 pound man, who over the past hour has has drunk seven or eight drinks in the past hour. That is someone who is not ca a casual drinker, let's just say. Now, I don't know how others would, would frame that, but that's how I'm framing it. So I think we have to really think about the fact that, uh, and we've got over 80% of the drivers who are at the legal limit or above. So two thirds are significantly higher, twice as high as legal limit, 80% greater than the, the legal limit, we have a significant issue of, of people who um, have significant issues with the use of alcohol and other substances who are contributing the most to the problem. And I think that's causing us to really look at a lot of the issues differently than we have before. A lot of the laws that we've put in place, a lot of the successes that we've had, you know, I would say maybe have dealt with a lot of the folks that are reasonable thinkers and reason and are putting reasonable actions in place. People that have gone out to a restaurant and maybe had one too many are thinking, you know what, I should probably call somebody to come take me home or have I'm, I've already planned ahead. I've got a designated driver. I know I'm going to be drinking tonight or I'm going to call an Uber or Lyft. What we're dealing with now are a lot of people who uh, are not making those decisions and probably need in their lives some other help. Um, even beyond what MAD is able to provide to them, but other help to deal with mental health issues, substance use issues. We've been hearing a lot about the opioid crisis in our country. We've been, and it, which is a tragedy. And it is really um, the issue largely of substance use in this country that we're dealing with and mental health challenges that I think are at the core of what we have to address at MAD and work in partnership with others in order to get to some of those core root causes of the problem that we're seeing today. Yeah, I was going to suggest maybe to ask you about the collaboration aspect of this, because on the one hand, while the news isn't good about the increases, you seem to have been able to target where the challenge really lies. And so you can begin to really focus a larger share of your resources on that but it's obviously not something you can do alone. So how do you build the collaborations and who are you thinking about working with on this? Well, I think it's definitely something we have to do in partnership. And by the way, all the work we've ever done before has been in partnership with others. Like we've never been able to do this alone. We've always been in partnership with law enforcement, for example, um, or with legislators or with other organizations involved in traffic safety to do the work we've done up at this point. So that word partnership is gonna have to continue. That, that action of partnership is gonna to have to remain an essential part of, of what we do at MAD. It, what it means though, is that our partners are gonna look even different, even more different than, we're, than, uh, than what we've had in the past. So for example, um, you know, a couple of things I'll just say, I think we have to double down on this idea that um, the impaired driver, a lot of the impaired drivers who are, um, who are leading to the most in terms of arrests and crashes are those mainly men uh, in their 20s and early 30s. Um, and those are not necessarily, um, you know, uh, offenders who are just born yesterday. These are folks that may be uh, having, ha have a problem, but that problem may have developed from even early in life. We know that a young person who starts drinking early um, in their teen years is significantly more likely to be an impaired driver that by the time they're in their 20s and 30s. So we think, you know, one of the solutions is that we got to go back to the basics of making sure we reach young people early, early in their lives, middle school and high school, to make sure they're aware of the dangers of underage drinking and substance use. And remember, 
it's not just alcohol today. We're seeing a growing trend in what we call poly use. So the combination of alcohol and other substances, the legalization and the commercialization of cannabis is now a big factor in what we're seeing on our roads. And that will continue to grow as more legalization and commercialization occurs. So we've got to make sure young people understand the dangers of alcohol use, cannabis use, and other substances. And then we've got to continue to raise awareness with young adults um, in, you know, as they continue to mature to make sure they continue to hear those messages, to make sure they continue to understand um, how this kind of behavior can be so damaging to both themselves and to the community at large. So that's around raising awareness. And then we've got to form partnerships to my earlier point with other organizations that are involved in spaces where we haven't traditionally been as active. So, you know, providers of mental health services, uh, federal and state governmental uh, and local uh, authorities who are focusing on serving mental health needs in the community. How can we make sure that we are in relationship and in partnership with them uh, to make sure they understand how our issues are lining up with those as well, how we can advocate for more resources in those spaces to make sure people have access to the help that they need when they need it. You know, the idea that we could solve this issue with um, having and putting the burden completely on law enforcement to solve this issue is just really unreasonable and really unfair, I think, to law enforcement. We cannot expect a police officer to be on every single road, every single moment of the day, every single day of the year, catching that speeding or reckless driver who may be impaired. While we need law enforcement there and we rely on them, we've got to do more. We, we can't just rely on law enforcement alone. The last thing I just want to say, though, is one of the biggest opportunities that we have at MAD right now, we got legislation passed in 2021, um, a, a legislation called the HALT Act. It was named uh, in honor of a family of five that was killed in an impaired driving crash, in an impaired driving crash in Kentucky. Uh, legislation now is in place. There's now a mandate to get anti-drunk driving technology as a part of um, standard equipment in all cars. And what this would do is allow for sensors to passively detect impairment. Um, it will first start most likely with alcohol impairment and then move to other kinds of impairment over time. But what it will do is allow uh, for when a driver gets into their car, just through breathing in the car, allow for there to be passive detection of um, that driver being beyond the legal limit of being able to uh, drive uh, safely. And it will allow the car not to operate so that the car will not move if somebody is impaired. And what that will do is will, it will keep you know someone who is impaired, who may not be in a position to be able to reasonably make a decision about what's safe to do for them and for others to, to allow for that safety um, element to be put in place so that the car will not operate. This is a huge win. Uh, it's a game changer for us in, in the work that we're doing. And that's something we're also working on so that while we're working on behavior change of individuals, supporting individuals who may be struggling with their mental health and substance use and alcohol use, we also need to make sure that cars are safer and that communities and the public at large know that there are safety measures in place to keep people safe, uh, even if people are struggling in their own lives with things that they uh, have to deal with in other ways. So this is another big opportunity, a game changer. Estimates show it will save 10,000 lives per year. If we have 13,000 people dying because of impaired driving, saving 10,000 of those 13,000 uh, is is probably the most the biggest change we can make in terms of uh, dealing with impaired driving on our roads. So we're working hard to make sure we can get that through regulation uh, and actually into into production with uh, cars uh, as soon as possible. Wow, and the injuries too. You know, just uh, and the injuries. We don't yeah. count. We know we. We don't get good data on um, the number of injuries, but we know that if there are 13,000 fatalities, there are hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. who are injured every year. So I think we tend to minimize, um, you know, the issue because we look, uh, even though the most, uh, the most critical uh, factor in all of this work is when we lose, lose a life. Mm -hmm. We can't also, we also need to be remind, re, uh, reminded of the fact that people are, who are involved in impaired driving crashes often are dealing with life altering injuries. Right. 
Um, and we don't want to minimize that as well. So thank you for raising that. It's hundreds of thousands of people that, you know, whose lives could be changed if we could make this kind of progress at MAD that we're talking about. Well, that's awesome. Are you getting any pushback on that? What kind of pushback might you be getting on? I'm sure everybody's not in agreement. <laughs> that wouldn't be America, would it? Oh, it's hard, right? <laughs> well, I think I think there's some areas where people are raising questions, and I think um, people should uh, raise raise really legitimate questions, or, and we should answer them and have solutions for them, and we are uh, around um, maybe a number of concerns that they may have. One of the things that we've been hearing about our concerns around privacy and data. Look, this is an issue that exists for all of us. Yeah. Um, we're sitting here. I know you've probably got your phone in front of you somewhere. I do too. My phone is listening to me right now, <laughs> hearing everything that I'm saying. And uh, if I say something about going on a cruise to the Greek islands tomorrow, I'm guarantee you I'm going to get <laughs> an advertising ever advertisement felt uh, fed to me, mm -hmm. um, soliciting me for, um, a cruise line that is willing to offer a, a deal, right? The funny one for me is that we have this thing that kind of sweeps the floor and every yes. so often. <laughs> the Roomba, yes, yes. The Roomba is like listening in on what we're doing. Yes. Hard to believe. You know, I was just at the Governor's Highway Safety Association and talking on a panel around uh, the future of road safety mm -hmm. and the moderator um, highlighted the Jetsons uh, you know, cartoon that I used to love when I was a little girl. Uh, and it and it and it uh, showed it, during the Jetsons. It showed like um, you know motorized cleaners of your floor. That mm -hmm. you know this was back in the '60s, right? right? But it was already predicting that we would have a room. But so to your point, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, so the issues of privacy and data are ever present in when you talk about technology. Um, the technology we're talking about is technology that would not collect your personal data. It would not reveal your personal data um, to anyone for any reason, uh, any more than your backup camera today, which I rely on. I don't know how it would drive or backup or be in a oh my garage or a parking lot without my backup camera, any more than your backup camera collects mm -hmm. data on you. You know, this is about keeping people safe. This is not about reporting you to uh, Big Brother or making uh, authorities or anyone else aware of your uh, you know, what's going on in your vehicle. This is about keeping people safe and we have to do, we have to do what is in the best interest of public safety. So there's a lot that we're working with on the rulemaking process to make sure that all those issues around pri privacy and data are addressed and that we maintain that privacy for individuals. That is, you know, that's something I care about. I care about that for my children as well. I care about it for all of us. That That's one of the things. Obviously, this, is, this would be a big change in um, how, Autom automobiles are um, are are manufactured in this country and potentially around the world. So that obviously is something that we have to factor in that this would be a big change for the um, automotive companies and and we want to work with them to make sure that this kind of change can be accommodated the way they've accommodated other kinds of safety features in the past and we've been able to overcome those barriers. You know, I think one of the things that we have to lose sight of is even though there is change and even there are even though there will be adjustments to this there is nothing that should come between us and the ability if we have it to save lives this technology exists today this technology um, is not in the jetsons future it's ha it is available to us right now mm -hmm. it just has to get into the cars mm -hmm. so if we have a solution that we know exists that can save 10,000 lives a year um keep hundreds of thousands of people from being injured every single year. The question is, why would we not do that? Yeah. And what is the argument against that? It is hard to imagine that there's a legitimate art, uh, argument that should say, well, no, I think we should probably pass on that. Yeah. You know, try saying that to the many thousands of victims mm -hmm. and survivors that we work with at MAD, who've lost loved ones, who lost children, um, spouses, family members, loved ones um, who themselves have been injured in a crash. You try saying that to people that we that this is not something that we can afford to do. It is not something that's in the best interest of the public. It's very hard to be able to legitimately go to any family and say that we should not be working as hard as possible if we have solutions to put those solutions in place. And so one of the things we do at MAD is we work with victims and survivors and they have legit, they have all said that this is something they will fight for 
because if it means saving someone else's life, maybe it didn't work for them. Maybe it wasn't in place for their family member, but if it can be in place for someone else, if it can protect someone else's child, keep them safe at night when they're coming home from party or from the prom or from homecoming or just out running errands, then we should do, we should make every effort to, to, uh, to make sure that this solution is in place. So that's what we're doing at MAD is to, is, is working hard for victims and survivors today, but those that would be a victim and survivor in the future and making sure we can keep people as safe as possible. Wonderful. Well, Stacy, we're at time, but, but yeah. thank you so much for doing this. I really thank appreciate you. it. I know your schedule is incredible, but. <laughs> well, thank you for all the work you do, Art, and, um, for keeping the nonprofit sector strong, for keeping us accountable. You know, it's really important. Um, we believe in this and we believe in your work. And so it's nice to be able to tell our story at Mad, and that we appreciate the time. Well, great. Well, listen, to all of you who are listening to this show for the first time, this is the Heart of Giving podcast. It's a weekly show. We have a new episode every Tuesday. So I hope you'll subscribe. And if you want to support the show, you can do that by going to give.org making a contribution, and we will put it to great use. I hope we'll see you back here next week. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.